Perfect. Okay. Um, welcome to the sixth um, webinar. I think we're calling these. Uh, I hope you uh, all enjoyed the, um, the little exercise. Um, I often find that that particular exercise has a certain therapeutic value because it means that people can vent their anger about something that has been rankling for um, some time. And we have had sessions, great fun, where, where the two boats involved in the incident were actually at the session. And so we immediately said, well, it's time to hear the protest. And um, we could, it, it was um, so much more fun doing protest protest like that when people are actually quite angry about things. And anyway, um, I'm going to share my screen. So first of all, um, a comment on the entries. Uh, you all did very well on the full entry. Um, the, uh, I think everybody got five out of five because all of the, everything was there. It became a bit more difficult when the exercise was to write as little as possible. If I go on to share my screens, where we are, there we are. Okay, so um, the protest contents. This is all. This today is all about the, the contents of a protest. So, if you have a look at Rule sixty one point two, the first thing and it's um, a necessary condition is that the protest identifies the incident and we'll come back to that later if the protest in, in identifies the incident then before the hearing the protestor can identify the uh, the protestor and the protestee that's before the hearing starts. That's, uh, it's difficult to hold a protest hearing if you don't know who the protest and the protestor, protestor and the protestee are. Once again, if the protest identifies the incident, then before the hearing, you can identify when and where the incident took place. And there is a condition on this that um, if you if the protest form doesn't identify where and when, when and where the protest took place, but you later identify it, you have to provide the protestee with a reasonable time to prepare. Sorry, um, I seem to have jumped a slide. And if before or during the hearing, you can identify any rule that the protester believes has broken, People often get very worried because they have to put down the, 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 the which rule has been broken, but you don't really have to. And give the name of the protesters representative. Very often that information is not on the form, but it is incredibly useful because it means that there's some way, usually some way of contacting you and know who you contact. So those are the minimum uh, the, the contents, what, what has to actually be on the protest form. And in the case of the full protest where you will get allowed to write as much as you want, everybody got everything. They, the, I, the incident was clearly identified, the protestor and the protestee were identified. Where the incident took place, when it took place, which rule was broken, which protest, everybody got that right. So the problem is that we don't always have three hours to actually uh, write a protest. And very often there's minutes. Um, increasingly, events are trying to put quite a short time limit on. Very often it's one hour after the last boat finished. If you're at the back of the fleet and you're having to sail in, by the time you get ashore, you, you might not have a lot of time. So basically, the question I was asked here is, how little does there need to be on the form? What's the minimum you can get away with? Technically, uh, if you identify the incident on the form, that's 
all that is required before the hearing. However, um, it is always a good idea to identify the protestor and the protestee, simply because then we, everyone knows who we're talking about. Identifying the incident. Uh, you, this is about identifying, just giving enough information to make clear that an incident in which a rule may have been taken, may have been broken, took place. Okay. Uh, that's what it, what the port, the protest form is is doing. It, it it's actually telling the protestee and any other parties that this is what we're talking about. Okay. Um, you can draw a diagram. It often helps, but it is not obligatory. And thank you to our friends on the other side of the IRSC who have a case on that, which is 188, 1988, so three. Um, if you're not in a hurry and you don't, you're not good at drawing, you don't have to put the uh, draw in a diagram. You just need to put enough information to make clear that that incident took place. I was trying to think up of a test of, is there enough information? And so the one I came up with, if, if you could be useful, is that can the protest committee read the form and then give the protestee, if he walks into the protest office, enough information to know which incident is being protested? If you look at it that way, that, that's what we need to know. The, the, the whole point of this, requirement is so that the protestee knows what the incident is about and if you imagine have i written enough so that somebody can read it and tell us what the incident is that will be enough information it's not a an affidavit it's not a deposition it's not a full literary account of the incident okay it's a piece of paper that gets you into the protest room, you as the protestor, and allows the protestee to know what you're talking about enough to prepare. Um, thanks to Gemma, he came up with a very nice uh, formulation. It's right, the minimum amount possible that's relevant to the critical facts in the rules that are applicable. You need to actually it, 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 this is an incident about a, where a rule is being broken. You need to put enough information in, but no more, so that we can follow that. And if I give an example, you could, somebody could write, I entered the zone on starboard and X tacked in front of me. And well, one reaction to that is, so what? What's the incident? Okay, there isn't, that doesn't say, a rule's been broken that just says, yeah, there was a boat attacked in the zone. Okay. Uh, if you were rewrite it as I entered the, the zone on starboard, a boat on port, attack, completed attack and I had to sail above close hull to avoid her. You've given a little bit more information. I'm not saying this is a perfect example, but I think Gemma's signaling that he thinks it's too much. Uh, but you're identifying an incident in which a rule has been broken um, and that's enough for to start the whole process rolling on the process hearing. What we usually find is that people write far too much, they spend hours writing a complete description of the incident um, and very often they give information that they probably may, may regret having gave them afterwards. Uh, identifying the protester and the protestee, well, you usually know who you are. Uh, some laser sailors change boats so often that they can't remember their sail number and they have to go away and look it up. Uh, but that's a problem. Uh, identifying the other boat can be problematic. Um, once again, in a laser fleet where you know everybody has 
relative new, new boats, all the numbers look the same. Um, so sometimes you can't put a sale number, but you can put some other uh, indication, which allows you then to find more detailed information about who the boat is. Okay, but it's a good idea to um, indicate on the form that, I mean, I don't know the sale number at the moment, I'm going looking for it. I know it's a, um, a Spanish boat, um, and um, so I'm going to look for it. And those really, um, I, I, that's enough on a protest form. If you've got those two facts, or those two elements, um, the that's enough. Now, in the uh, examples that you gave in, some people did not really give enough information to say, um, to identify the incident. One of the things we have to remember is that, in, especially in a small fleet, you might cross the same boat several times during the same race. There may be three or four races in the day. So, um, you know, although when and where the incident took place is, is not uh, obligatory, it might help to identify the incident. So it is helpful to know that it's on the first beat because you might have had an incident with the same boat on the second beat, which uh, you decided not to protest. Um, so there's, there's elements like that that, that are important. Um, it doesn't happen often, but sometimes we uh, do get protests coming in where we don't actually know what the incident, where it was, when it was, what happened. It's a bit vague. Um, and the question is, is it fair to uh, protestee on that case because you're you're not really telling him what he's being protested about okay um so as i say all i'm going to say is um uh congratulations for all of you on the first uh, effort um although some of you needed several pages on the uh Second exercise, there was uh, one person who uh, I, I did penalize because they did correctly ev ev identify the incident, but um, uh, they weren't exactly concise in doing so. Okay. Um, and so, if, in the terms of the exercise of writing it as short as possible, they, they, they hadn't done that. I'm not really going to say very much more. Um, I think Gemma might want to say something about um, what's strategically a good idea. But um, uh, just to say, I think a lot of protesters could save themselves a lot of stress by adopting a, a more minimalist approach to what they put on the protest form. It is quite surprising how little we look at the protest form during the well, once we've decided that the protest is valid we then listen to the stories of the, the various people the one exception to that is sometimes the um protest or tells a completely different story um and in that case we in case we would start asking questions but um uh, i think very often People who are protesting think they, that they are, the, re, the success of their protests uh, depends on them making a full and complete argument in the, uh, on the protest form. And I think the key thing to remember is that the protest form is to allow you to get into the protest room and to allow the protestee the opportunity to, to know what we're going to be talking about in the protest room so that he can then start thinking about it and preparing okay so once i'm going to keep this quite short thank you any questions
score. I, I will say against the against the backdrop of the longer, yeah, you know, descriptions is that the the protest committee and the jury secretary that are starting to prepare the the the, the portfolio of protests yeah. and the scheduling mm -hmm. and etc. have very limited time and and attention span. So yep. they want to identify quickly whether this is going to be an 18-3, a Rule 10, a Rule yep. 13, a Rule 15, or thereabouts. What's the, going to be the main issue yep. that the protest committee is going to focus on? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> when that goes into the, the, the jury, they are going to follow a very, very similar pattern, mm -hmm. whereby they are all going to scan the protest. And the more you write, the more you take away from their attention span, and they'll say, okay, well, none of these I'm going to look at anymore. Just bring the two people in the, mm -hmm. in the room. So you're, you're losing the opportunity to make the point very, very yep. clearly at the beginning of this is someone tagged in front of me. I'll, before they completed the tag to Star Wars, there was contact. Yep. You know, I do. Yep. That sort of thing. So that's, but that's one, one person boat just wrote a boat tagged in front of me. Mm. And that's, you know, that's not an incident. Really, <laughs> well, it's not an incident yeah. for a protest. Yeah. Um, I thought it'd be nice, you know, since there's a, a nice mix of, of sailors, if there's no questions, what tips or tricks do people have when dealing with, with protests? You know, I have a few in my, I've lost it now, but I have a, a collection of few that I'm happy to share at some point or mm -hmm. include, but, uh, you know, it'd be lo lovely to, to hear what you guys think going into protests. <clears throat> Anyone? I'll give you the first one that I have. Do you always protest, never protest, only protest sometimes? And what's the criteria that you use to, 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 to go into, you know, file a protest or not? That's a very good question. Um, I haven't been in a protest room for more years than I care to remember. But that doesn't say that we are, that I haven't been in a protest situation. Mm -hmm. But uh, when we're just out on Dublin Bay, we just, unless it's a, unless it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a very serious situation, we don't bother. We tell them we are, but we, we never actually go through it because we just we can't be bothered going through the rigmarole of actually having to go to uh, uh, the protest. But it is extraordinary out on Dublin Bay. Yeah, the ignorance of the sake <laughs> of the rules that is, <laughs> the, uh, yeah. even the basic rules, even the basic rules. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to convince me. I believed it. <laughs> um, so I have a, a rule of thumb. I will only protest if I'm, I'm sure above 80% that I'm right. Okay, anything below that, I'll wait to see what the other boat does. Mm -hmm. If they protest, if they hail protest, I might consider even taking a penalty, whatever the appropriate penalty might be, obviously always trying to avoid contact. Because the, the minute that you progress that into a protest hearing situation, your odds will drop to a 50-50. And so you have to keep keep a ratio that is high in your favor. Two, is the protest that I'm about to file uh, important from a results point of view? Okay. Is this DSQ in, or trying to DSQ a boat going to make me significantly increase my, my places, all right, or taking this person off the podium, if that's what I want to do? Because the alternative is, you know, I could end up DSQ too. And you don't really want that scenario to, to play out. Okay. And always consider, you know, uh, the, to what, the, the, the rule of thumb is avoid going into the protest room as much as you can. And that might actually take, even though you're not 100% sure you broke a rule, to take a penalty turn. And one of the reasons we tend not to take penalty turns on the water especially in bigger boats, is because we have no practice in the house. <clears throat> and it's easier to keep sailing and hope for the best rather than say, okay, you know, two quick turns here. I will lose three positions. I'll gain them in the next leg. You know, I'm 
fire sale or whatever it might be. So I will always keep that in mind. Um, yeah, there is, there, is, there is an argument on uh, for big boats. Uh, some people have, will say that a uh, two boat, the two turn penalty is a not appropriate to big boats that uh, the 20 percent penalty is more appropriate but that's, um, that's, that's i agree that's, with you people don't don't practice enough taking turns yeah. if if you're in an area where penalty turns is not what you know scoring penalties is what they are normally using that's absolutely fine you know be that as it may you know be sure that you will be able to execute the voluntary penalties that are required in the same instructions for the event that yep. you're going to hmm. you know i think in many cases, the, the reason for the people going into the protest room is because there's been a contact with damage and they would like to have some kind of... Uh, there's all sorts yeah. because uh, Dublin yeah. Bay is notorious for even the little touches to, to people just hold grudges for so many years that it's just any chance is a good chance you know, to have a go at somebody. You, know, uh, you see it all the time. But anyway... There is, I have known sailors who um, have had a deliberate policy of uh, protesting in uh, less important regattas. Yeah. Just so, just so they get a reputation of being somebody who, who does protest. So that if they go to the national championships and they shall protest, everybody will take a turn. Uh, just to keep out of the protest room with them. Gordon, on one of your slides, I thought I saw that the minimum content as a second yes. slide said that you need to identify the protest or and protest. Group. Yes. But I didn't think that was the case because it's only 61.2B, um, the incident, that you need to go yeah, you, Yes, but you're going to have to identify both of them before the protest hearing. Oh, that's different. That's but not so, on the form. Yes. So uh, the... Um, you're going to have to do it. Uh, you don't have to put it. Well, I, I honestly don't understand why you would, uh, except for, because you're in such a hurry that you've made a mistake, you, you're not going to identify yourself. Sorry, well, I agree. I mean, I, I personally would always have put me yes. and, and because why would you not? So and, 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 and yes, I, I agree with you that technically it is not an absolute requirement, but I would say it is a. Um, uh, the protest won't start until you put got that information. So you might, say, if you've got it, put it on straight away. And if you didn't, not that I wouldn't, but if you didn't, how does the protest committee identify uh, to to notify the other boat? Well, that's they won't do anything until you've identified him. Hmm. Right. But is that not too late then at that stage? Is well, it's that's why it's. But you've got to do it before the hearing. Yeah. But it happens in different aspects of the sport. Um, Gemma and myself have done quite a bit of radio sailing and quite often you've got no idea what the sail number is, but you know it's the blue boat. Yeah. And so uh, there's a protest and you identify it as the blue boat and then you find out later what the sail number is. Um, it, as I say, in the laser fleet is quite common. You know, who can actually, even if they can read it, know that it's 201975. You know, how four hours later can you actually remember that number? So, but you know, it's um, uh, the Spanish guy who sails with the guy that you had a drink with last night. And and so you won't be, you'll, you'll be able to put down, it's a Spanish boat, for instance, and then you, you've, got, you've got to go and find it. But if you don't find that, there's not going to be a hearing. Mm -hmm. Just, it seems like well, a lot not, there's not going to be a protest against the other boat. There's uh, right. other things you can do. It seems like a number of us have picked the same incident, and I picked it from the point of view of trying to learn from it. It is mm. backing in the zone from port to starboard. Yes. And um, if a boat is outside the zone to begin with, and they're on star on starboard, and the port the boat attacks onto the port within the zone, the other boat then catches up with them by you know get, going into the zone. Do they have that right? all the way, even though the attack happened while through the boat on starboard was outside the zone. Sorry, you've got a, it's a port hand rounding or a starboard hand rounding? Port, port hand rounding. So, boat on starboard, Yeah. outside outside the zone. Outside the zone. Okay. The boat on port attacks 
within the zone or into the so zone. It, well, it, it's interesting to say what the rule says. It doesn't say tax. It says passes head to wind. Okay. And is now fetching the mark. Yes, I believe. Oh. I believe. Yes, yes, so, yes. It's so, so the, the, the key one of the key points is that the starboard tack boat doesn't actually have to be fetching the mark, which is a bit surprising. But, um, but the point I'm asking is, does the does the boat on starboard have those rights, even though he wasn't in the zone when the boat tacked with, when the other boat tacked within the zone? With eighteen point three doesn't actually give rights to the starboard tack boat. It puts an obligation on the rule on the the boat that was on port, and those obligations are not to cause the other boat to sail above close hauled, the starb attack boat, or the other obligation is to give room at the mark, yeah. give mark room, sorry, to the starb attack boat if the starb attack boat becomes overlapped inside. So both those those things apply. Do they do? I'm asking the question. Do they apply to a boat which is on starboard, which was on starboard outside the zone? Yes. When the boat created the situation. Well, within... it applies only to a starboard boat that was outside the zone. Yes. Before yes. before but... before he passed head to wind. Yes. yes. So so yeah, especially yeah. if you are outside the zone. Yes. It applies. It doesn't apply to a boat that was on starboard who who'd got, gone from starboard to port from port to starboard inside the zone, and then there's another boat coming in. Okay, it's if that boat is outside, and then comes into the zone, and the other boat inside the zone passes head to wind. And as I say, <clears throat> Rule eighteen three doesn't give any new rights to. Uh, the starboard tack boat it gives two new obligations to the port the boat that was on port but the boat the boat the, the, the starboard boat could actually approach the ley line on port tack outside the zone and then they are the starboard boat coming into the zone yes if they if they if they've if they if they're on starboard before they I mean, come into the zone yeah uh, shall not cause a boat that has been on starboard tack since entering the zone yeah. Okay. Sorry, uh, what do you mean by the zone? Is this um, two boat lengths within the mark? Well, it's actually three. It has been for three quite yeah. some time. Oh, I've been, God, I've been so good to people over the years. Uh, for about 12 years, is it 12? <laughs> three, uh, sorry, three boat, yes, yeah, three, three, yeah. three. three. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Except when it's four, of course, or two. Or two. Team, team racing is two. Radio sailing is four, and I can't remember what it is in board sailing. I think it's three. Sorry, Gordon, just on that, on the zone, um, if the, the boat that tacks from port to starboard is a small little boat, yep. then their three boat lengths are their three boat lengths. At that time, they tacked. But the boat approaching on starboard, I presume, enters his zone, which is his three boat lengths, when he enters the three boat length zone relative to his boat. There's a case on that, isn't there? As a case. Sorry, um, it's actually in the definition of the zone as well, isn't it? No. Yeah. It is three hull lengths, so not boat lengths, hull lengths, that's if, if you've got a bow sprit, it's important, of the boat nearest nearer to the mark. Oh, so the boat approaching from starboard behind them can only um, get worried within the three boat lengths of the little boat's three boat yes. lengths. I was once uh, on a racetrack in a traditional regatta and we were in a 12 foot dinghy and one of the other boats was Versheda. Well, coming into the mark, if we were nearer the mark, it was our, <laughs> the zone was only 36 foot long because we had a 12 foot boat. But we put out of the way. We certainly did when we were on port. Uh, but it's it. The definition is very clear. The, the area around a mark within a distance of three hull lengths of the boat nearer to it. It's amazing how many answer questions you can answer by actually reading the definitions. But anyway. <laughs> okay. So uh, going back to to tips and tricks, but does anybody else have any any more that they use? Yeah, I, I do. Go, Emmet. Go. Emmet, go. Yeah, I, I would, I would, and quite seriously, I would 
consider not putting in a protest if I knew some of the people on the protest panel and their, their strengths and weaknesses. <laughs> I mean, I mean that I mean that in the nicest possible way. That if you knew it was a serious event and you, you had one person that was reasonable and two kind of ropey people, mm. and it was the odds are just stacked against you. The risk is too high. Then I'd consider not doing it. So you, you have to. Yeah, but you you are you are reinforcing the 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 easy of the of the probability of of getting a result. Mm. You know. So yeah. Yeah. At the end. I think um, it's always worth. Well, what goes through my head is always it's always worth deciding what is the best possible outcome and what's the worst possible outcome, depending on the incident that it is. So if you're the starboard boat in a port starboard and there wasn't any contact, the worst possible thing that can happen is it'll be dismissed. So yeah. your, result, your result won't change. So that's kind of a free protest. Mm -hmm. You might as well, because the best thing that can happen is you'll get the port boat disqualified and you might move up one. But the worst thing is nothing will happen. Whereas if you're in an incident where there's been contact, maybe some damage, or it's a markroom thing, chances yeah, are yeah. you could get disqualified too. And mm -hmm. then it's a bit more, mm, do, how, do, how, do, how much do I want to chance this? So always keep that in mind as well. Mm -hmm. What's the worst possible thing that could happen? Um, it's a bit different if you're in team racing, like I am most of the time, where you're umpiring, then it's just, you don't have to avoid, you don't have to miss the cue for the bar or whatever. It's just, you're gonna get a call in the water. But, um, Except in, in team racing, it's noticeable that the American teams just take penalties. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, if, if somebody protests them, they don't, unless it's completely obvious that it's a, uh, the protest is not going anywhere, they'll just take a turn. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I was worth remembering as well, you can take a turn and still protest. Yeah. Um, so you could take a turn to protect, sort of protect yourself, in inverted commas, and still go through the protest. And yeah. even if you were in the wrong, assuming there was no... Uh, damage and there wasn't any sportsmanship issue, then you're protected. Mm. That's always worth bearing in mind. The same with the 1711 protests. You know, if you are the, the boat that needs to keep clear, as long as you keep clear, the outcome is always going to be, you know, the worst outcome is just the protest is going to be dismissed. Yep. If you are the outside boat and inside, uh, you know, in a rule 18 a scenario where you think the other boat didn't have inside, as long as you gave room, the worst possible outcome is going to be that the protest gets dismissed. So, again. Yeah. Um, what do people think about uh, people telling untruths or lies at, in, at the protest hearing? Let's take a, a simple example. You state you, 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 sh you flew a flag and you shouted protest, and the, the protestee says clearly, no, I never saw a flag and I never heard a hail. Now, that's a two just totally different stories. But it'd be very unfair well, to dismiss the protest and say the person who stated they did say fly the flag and actually they didn't. But first of all, the rule says that you have to display the flag and to hail. It doesn't doesn't say it has to be seen or heard. That's an important point. Um, and uh, the so. Very often, the the pro, especially in classes where you don't have to show a flag, the the protestee is unaware that you know. But then, if, if you're in a mark, a mark rounding with fifteen dinghies going around, there's such a lot of noise you might not hear something. Okay, uh, the jury has to be satisfied that that, or, or have no reason to believe that a hail was not made. I would it would almost put it like that. Um, you raise the question of lying, and that comes up very often. Uh, people's vision of an event, of an incident, and their memories of their incident can be so different. Classic is when there's a car a collision on a crowded square, car at crossroads, uh, when there's lots of people. Will everybody agree what colors the cars are? Probably not. Okay, because there are, the police will call, the guards will come and see them, you know, half an hour, an hour later. What color was the car that came in uh, that hit the other one? And some people will say red and some will say well, blue and, you know, and that's what they're, they're telling the truth. Um, so I think we have to be very, very careful uh, about um, 
moving on from people have very different appreciation or um, memory of what happened to somebody's lying. Yeah. Uh, it is the number of cases where we can actually say and demonstrate that somebody is lying are quite rare. And that will be rule 69. So it wouldn't be the level of proof would have to be what's it comfortable satisfaction. Um, comfortable satisfaction so you know you have to be very very sure there have been cases uh, but they are rare um, I don't know whether you've seen the the, um, the gorilla test it's it's a wonderful um, test where you've got two two groups of people and the one in white one in black and they each has a basketball of the same color and they're throwing the basketball between them and it's all mixed up because of the two groups are together and you ask people to count the number of times that the white team passed the ball and they will usually get the right number one or two each side and the guys who are looking at the black ball um and will also get you know if it's 15 the actual number is 15 they'll get 14 15 or 16 passes but if you then say well what about the gorilla half of the people have no idea what you're talking about because what happens is halfway through their the minute and a half that they're throwing their balls around a guy dressed up as a gorilla walks through the scene waves at everybody and then walks off and because you're so concentrated on looking at counting the number of ball passes that have been made you don't see the gorilla Okay, um, you can also uh, there's also questions. Uh, sometimes one member of the team will walk off, so they'll start off with four, and uh, they'll end up with three. Most people mm -hmm. won't notice that, and um, they'll change the color of the curtains half of the behind the room. I've seen one there's the it's in a um, ballroom or somewhere, and the curtains color changes halfway through. Now they might be critical pieces of information that people haven't seen. You know, if the whole thing, if the whole incident in this depends on the number of people who were there at the start and the, num the number at the end, because the fourth person had walked out and stabbed uh, somebody in off screen, okay? Um, most people would not have seen that person walk off the scene. And then in protests, we are dealing with that kind of phenomenon. These are incidents that happen very quickly. They, they are complex incidents where you're looking in different directions at the same time, where you are carrying out tasks that are critical to the result of your boat and also the safety of the boat and yourself <laughs> at the same time. All of this is going on. And then uh did i hear protest or um was i uh 3.1 boat le hull lengths from the zone or was i 2.9 hull lengths from the zone and what about the other boat um so um the we are going to get information that is contradictory which is partial which is seen from somebody's point of view and filtered through what he was looking for at the time so what was important to him and what he remembers afterwards what's important for him to remember um and that is why as the other point is that we are not up we as judges are called upon to evaluate what we hear on the basis uh, of what was most likely to have happened and we base that on the what the the witnesses say but also on our experience and we know that boats don't aren't 10 boat lengths or apart uh, and then two seconds later they're touching you know, um, we know that things take time or they don't take time and and we, we that all filters into what we do to establish um, on the balance of probability what happened so the number of cases where somebody 
we are convinced that somebody has lied are incredibly rare. But we hear it all the time at the bar. Okay, okay thank you. So it's a bit of a rant, but it's um, it comes up so often. <laughs> Gordon, I, I had a question. When um, you mentioned a few times that the, the kind of burden of proof for the normal rules is um, balance and probability, yes. where's, where's that? Um, where's that defined? I was just looking for it. Um, there's a discussion in the case, um, and I can find the case number for you. Yeah. Somebody. Yeah. Balance. Uh, case one two two. One two two, yes. Thanks very much. Which I'm hastily looking up just to see. It tells you what. Question one of case one two two says. Um, it's an interpretation on the term com comfortable satisfaction yes. and examples of its use, but it also in, do, in, in, in doing that, it, it gives you what the other two standards are. Yes. And that the balance of probabilities is the least strict of the three and, and um, actually, uh, let me just check something else here. Balance, balance. There's also a discussion, I think, in the um, judge's manual. Yeah. Well, and um, Seema, you said that you wouldn't you wouldn't protest if you thought that you know you the chance are going to be a little bit low. But if you go back mm -hmm. to the fundamental paragraph, the first one, sportsmanship and the rule, yep. it implies that you should protest in order to enforce the rules. Yeah, but if if you bring it to practical terms, right, as well, mm -hmm. and and I, I'm all okay with that. But at the end of the day, a lot of sailing, uh, it's a little bit what what Robin was pointing out. It's on street credibility, if you wish, right? And if you protest all the time and you don't get successful outcomes, you are going to be the guy that always protests, is a pain in the ass, is dragging everybody into the protest room all the time. So it's better to calculate the chances where you, you know, to, to, to fight those protests that you know you, you are going to, you know, in the balance of probabilities, you think you're going to succeed because that means that you're protesting when you know you're right and you can prove it. It's that kind of, 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 of thinking. Just, um, and obviously, if you, are, if you are playing yourself for a world championship or, or you know, international event and you're at the top, you're going to gauge your chances very, very carefully be, be, before launching into a protest. In Dunleary, we, we say it from different clubs, and sometimes yeah. there can be a tendency to not protest against uh, a member of your own club because you know you yeah. don't have to go to the bar, etc. But if you're in a third part, if you're in a third boat who's behind an incident and you see quite clearly a rule being broken and no one yeah. protests, are you entitled to protest those boats for not protesting? No, you are entitled to protest them for the incident that you saw. Not for the for the fact that they didn't protest. Yeah, the, the protest for the incident and, and have it heard yeah. of the incident. It it used to be the case, and it gave gave. Uh, did you could protest the boats for not protesting, and it gave rise to a lot of very vexatious and very uh, a lot of protest that really upset a lot of people. There's other a, a, a number of other little tips in there. For example, you know what are you allowed to bring into a a, a, a protest room or not. I've been denied to bring my own notes into a pro protest hearing, you know. Mm. You, you're allowed to bring your own notes, an iPad, a phone, you know, to a protest hearing. What do you guys think? Sorry, I can't understand you. Z Z my... oh, for example, there are a lot of little procedural nuggets where things go awry in, in, in a protest. Do you think you are allowed to bring in an iPad, a telephone, your notes, you know, into a protest hearing? Um, I, I don't know. It's a simple answer. I don't know. I've, I've been denied, you know, I've, I w walked into a protest hearing once and I said, what, what are you doing with the iPad there? No, 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 no iPads, nothing electronic here. Just leave everything out. 
And I said, why I'm not allowed to have my iPad in the hearing? I have my notes in my iPad. I'm not allowed to have my notes. He says, no, I've been told this at a, at a, at a protest hearing in the delivery, <laughs> you know? For I guys. definitely ask people to, to, if they're going to use it, to show me that they're not recording. Like, I actually just- Agree on that. Agree on that. Yeah. You are allowed to bring in whatever materials yeah. you think are relevant for you to either present the evidence, ask your questions, take your notes, everything. There's no, there's no prohibition of what you can or cannot bring into the protest room as, as aids or materials to you. you know? The one thing you do not bring in is a pint of beer. Mm. Well, <laughs> because the, ju well, the judges aren't allowed to drink until they finish work. <laughs> and uh, that is just um, annoying them unnecessarily. Does that count for the protestees as well? <laughs> yes, yes. Does anybody else have any other questions? Uh, the, there's a question on the chat, oh, uh, uh, there was, yes. which is uh, from Boris, which is about radioing the VH uh, race officer. Now, in many the short events, answer is no. Come on. The, well, the short answer is no. There is a long answer. Is that in some events there is a requirement to inform the race off the race committee vote immediately after finishing that you intend protesting. This, to my mind, is justified in two cases. One in youth events, because it means that the young person who is sailing has to make the decision themselves that they want to protest before they go and uh, talk to their coach or parent, who may have completely different motivations for protesting. So I think it's very justified, and I think uh, in all of um, the big optimist events, that is that is a rule. Yeah. For adult events, the only time I would personally consider that it was appropriate is if it is an event where um, there is not a protest committee on standby. So you you know it is a small smallish event, but you want to hear the protest that evening. So you've You've arranged for somebody who might be at another event or wants to sit at home and watch the rugby on the television or whatever, that if there's a protest, you call them. Now, in that case, it, that sailing instruction is reasonable. Um, I don't like it, but it's reasonable. Okay. Um, I why would you inform the race officer that there's going to be a protest in any other case uh you could do it doesn't actually help but um, it doesn't count as notification to the other board, certainly not protest. notification yes yes hmm. or informing the, the other board that you're yeah. protesting it doesn't count hmm. for that but there are there are these quite special cases where uh, it can be justified, but, but then it has to be a sailing instruction and, and put in. The, uh, one of the other tips that I have is whenever you don't get the outcome that you want in a protest, whenever it's either dismissed or you get disqualified in, in, in the protest room, always, always ask for a copy of the protest in writing, please. Mm -hmm. It might not change anything, but there's always learning in, in keeping a collection of this, you know, and seeing what the thinking is and how, you know, people are writing the facts and whether you think they miss something important that you had said. There's no, beyond the appeals, there's no recourse, let's say, for, for that. But, but it, there's always, it, it, it always makes for interesting reading. Therefore, you know, you may learn a couple of things on those. Um, and the other point that what well, I have, whatever, 13, 15. Uh, increasingly, you won't get the um, the copy straight away. Yeah. Um, In fact, more, 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 yeah. very often the chairman will, will want to, you know, he'll have written something up very quickly. He'll want to tidy it up, probably put it, type it so it's legible. And increasingly, we're, we're, we're working straight onto the computer anyway so you know, yeah. it has to be 
printed. What um, is ha happening increasingly is, in fact, that the decision goes straight onto the computer system and it's accessible to everybody. That's a real change for a lot of judges because it means <laughs> that they have to write decisions that are um, uh, coherent, legible, um, and... Um, a standard has to be met. They have to meet standards, yes. Um, but Gemma may also made a good point, which if you go abroad to events or if you've got a boat, you know, people... Oh, yeah. Boats, um, get the protest in in your language and then get the time on it and then ask for time to get a translation. Okay. Um, now, the problem there is some judges will not accept that. They'll say, no, it's got to be in Spanish or Portuguese or Lithuanian or whatever. But if, if, if it is a problem, if it is a problem, get your, get your protest in, in English, in your case, and, uh, and ask for time. And if they say no, appeal. Um, Chris, you said at the outset there that you, you go for a point of conflict. Sorry, you're cracking up. Sorry? Yeah, I'm finding it the same. I'm, my, I'm receiving the crack of version myself, so it, it, if, if you can't hear me too well, I'll have to just maybe give it up. So let me persevere for a bit. If you find the two impossible to, to understand, i stop. Hmm. I hear it. Yeah, yeah, you're okay. It's okay. Um, you mentioned about brief protests, Chris. Um, but my understanding is, if you're deemed to have broken a rule, any rule, you will be disqualified. Therefore, even the Port Starboard situation, if the Starboard boat was deemed not to have taken enough avoiding action at the time, at the incident, yeah. they could have to have broken a rule, mm. and they could be disqualified. Yep. Yeah. If, um, so I'm just thinking about a normal sort of Port Starboard cross, where you as the starboard boat have a port boat that's trying to cross you and you have had to take avoiding action to avoid them. Right. You've had to bear away to avoid them, for example. In that kind of incident, the only rule that would be applying would be just normal rule 10, port boat has to keep clear. So if that happened and that goes to a protest, the only thing that can happen, there's only gonna be two possible outcomes. Either it will be the protest committee think the port boat did keep clear and so the protest will be dismissed or they think she didn't keep clear, so the protest will be upheld and the port tech boat will be disqualified. There's no rule that would, there's, there's no rule that you could have broken as the starboard boat. But you're right, if the incident was a bit different and you as the starboard boat had luffed or something into the port tech boat to make the incident worse, then yeah, that, that would be a different, a different case. Mm. But I think the over kind of arching point that I was trying to make was look at the incident that you were involved in and decide what is my, what are the risks here? For me mm -hmm. or for the other boat and because sometimes it may be there is no risk yeah fair enough i mean yeah okay thanks no worries is there anybody else want to ask anything any but i just say what um there are in incidents like the one we did the other day about um establishing an overlap at the at the committee boat mm. um there are people who are notorious for doing that and just a. uh there was one incident, one of my very first protests as a, as a national judge, where uh, the we disqualified the boat that had come in from astern, and it was remarkable the number of um, people who came up to me in the bar, bar afterwards and said, "Thank you, we've been he's been doing that for years. We've never managed to protest him, and when we have protested him, him he's managed to, to get the protest thrown out." Um, so. <laughs> There's um, sometimes protests can have um, an effect far beyond the, the actual incident. Um, and yeah, perhaps if a guy is notorious for always breaking a certain rule, um, <clears throat> it would be a good idea to get together and make sure that a decent protest is put, <laughs> put in against him when it succeeds. <laughs> So. I guess um, if nobody has any other questions uh, for now, then we'll tell you what our plan is for the next couple of weeks and what we're going to do the series. So, um, and Chairman and Gordon can correct me if I say any of this wrong. So this is going to be our kind of, this was our last uh, session of the kind of lockdown quiz. 
um, in inverted commas. So we're not going to be setting you any homework or anything or any more tasks, um, so to speak. Um, what we're going to do now, um, because we're starting to hopefully slowly get back to normal life, we'll, we'll see how it goes. We're going to switch tack a little bit and change this into a little bit of a course about how to deal with protests and how to hear protests essentially. So still focusing on you as a club sailor, how you handle protests essentially, um, whether that means being in them yourself as a sailor or being dragged in from the bar to, to help hear them at your club say. Um, so this has kind of been session one of that and we're going to keep going for another two weeks. Next week we'll be thinking a bit about how a protest actually works and, and the sort of mechanics of the thing. Um, so we're not going to set any homework, as I say, um, but we'll keep running these sessions. And then at the end of that, we might decide to keep going or might decide to do something else. We'll just see how it goes. Mm. Um, but that's essentially the end of the quiz. So I can tell you this. Well, we'll send out the maybe the full score thing, but I can tell you who the, the people with the top scores are in a kind of anonymous fashion. Mm. Um, so we split them into two categories. There's actually only one person in one of the categories because we, the person with the top score is actually a World Sailing International Empire. Um, and so we sort of put you in a category by yourself, um, that handicap. Um, so we'll say well done to JL, who has 52.5 points. Um, so it's kind of in the category of professionals. But then in our kind of category of non-professionals, which is kind of everybody else, and people that are not judges and umpires and are more club sailors, I can tell you the top three people are and their scores in an anonymous way. So um, in first place, we have JS with 47 points. Uh, then second place, LG and DG, uh, who have 46.5 points, so only half a point behind. And then HA with 42.5 points, then based on that. So um well done to you if js can please contact sarah louise um you will be entitled to claim a fabulous prize and um, to be very excited um i'm told the prize is very difficult to get so i look forward to that um we hope you've enjoyed it anyway this kind of quiz thing we hope this has kind of kept you occupied kept the brains going and you've learned a little bit um and i mean I, I, sorry i will be sending out your um a detailed email tomorrow to everybody from there brilliant um, and yeah, well done for me as well, because looking at the scores there, just everyone's scores gotten yeah. progressively better as the weeks have gone on. So you've obviously gotten a, gotten a great handle on how things work. And some of the answers that, particularly the one that I marked last week, some of the answers that we got were absolutely like at the standard we would see from judges at international events and stuff. Mm. So really well done. Um, we've been quite impressed. Um, yeah. So unless you, Gordon or Tim want to say anything about the rest of the, the rest of the weeks or anything like that? No, I, I, I would only just make a, a reminder that, um, you know, we're quite happy to answer your questions mm -hmm. in general terms. So whatever questions, issues you might come up with, we are happy to answer questions. You know, just drop us an email or drop us a release an email or whichever, you know, and, and we'll be sure to, to, to give answers to you and our best mm -hmm. possible advice as long as we are not... Uh, under a conflict of interest, but you know. And if you thank, you all, thank you all very much um, for the last seven weeks. It's been um, entertaining, but uh, most importantly, uh, a wonderful learning exercise, particularly for myself, and I'm sure all the other participants uh, would uh, agree with me. So I uh, thank you very much indeed, and uh, look forward to um, chatting next week. Thanks. So I have to go. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Just, just, just one small point. Um, I think the intention is still to bring out a new rule book in January for the first of January. I think so. Yeah. Um, what I'm going to suggest.